Welcome to A Healthy Curiosity, the podcast that explores what it takes to be well in a busy world. With self-care strategies from Chinese medicine, functional medicine, Ayurveda, neuroscience, and beyond. I'm your host, Brody Welch, a licensed acupuncturist and transformation catalyst, here to support you on your journey of health, happiness, and personal evolution. Welcome to A Healthy Curiosity. Today, we're going to be exploring a pretty huge topic about what it means to be embodied, what it means to have a body, the role of the body as something more than just a vehicle for moving our brains from place to place. It's not just a sack of meat. If you've listened to this show at all, you know that we are living rivers of energy and that in Chinese medicine, we think of the physical aspects of who we are as the yin and the less substantial the energetic field and that which is the activation process aspect of who we are is, is our yang. And that these are interrelated things. And then also from a Chinese medicine perspective, the physical and the emotional are the same thing. The, the, the chi of one system emotionally affects it physically and vice versa. So really this notion of the mind-body split is something that doesn't really exist. It really, the body can be conceived of as not just the physical, but also encompassing the mind. And we know that for those of us who believe that there is such a thing as the spirit, that the body can get us in touch with that as well. We get a lot of messages from advertising, from traditional media and social media about how our bodies are supposed to look and all the things we're supposed to do to get them to conform making some parts bigger and other parts smaller and removing hair here and growing it there and all these things that we are encouraged to do so that we can achieve some sort of beauty ideal. And there's a lot of focus on how the body looks externally and far less emphasis placed on what it's like to inhabit a body and what it's like to experience the body from the inside out or even how the body can be a portal to accessing expanded states of, of consciousness or simply different states of consciousness. I, early on my spiritual path, internalized the notion that the body is something to be transcended, that we have to somehow rise above the sensations and desires of the bodies in order to achieve these alignment with other planes of existence and to maybe even make what happens after we die better. And this is no longer what I believe. I believe the body is an integral part of my spiritual practice as well as my my self-study practice. And and the more that I learn about what's going on with my body, the more I understand about myself. This may be a, a screamingly obvious statement, but I think it it is one of the most mysterious and complex mysteries that we can explore. And I am so excited to be exploring this question with Brooke Thomas. Brooke is my guest today, and I have been listening to her on her various podcasts. Originally, she, I found her through Liberated Body, which then became Liberated Being, as some of the questions that she started being interested in were more than just things like, what is fascia, and, and, and more like, what is, <laughs> what is it like to be in a body moving through the world? Brooke Thomas works in a variety of ways to teach people how to cultivate a relationship with their bodies and thus their being as a whole, which can have a profound positive impact on both an individual and a collective level. At its core, her work is a lived inquiry about what it means to shift out of a mental or conceptual lens and into an embodied and experiential one. This shift changes everything about how we meet ourselves and the world. Brooke, welcome to A Healthy Curiosity. I'm so excited to speak with you today. Oh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's sweet to be here. I, I really am excited to dive into this with you because 
it's such a juicy topic and you have as the host of liberated being and uh, now bliss and grit you are engaged with this question on such a regular basis. Also your rolfing practice for 20 years, you, you were, you were in it, you know, what it's like to, to see clients one-on-one and to, and to coach them as, as you do in your embodied practice community. And I just feel like you're, you're a fellow traveler on the path who I have a great deal of respect for. And, and I'm excited to, to first off open with what you think embodiment means. <laughs> yeah, it's the big million dollar question. So I'll start by answering that by saying, I don't really know. I do know from a practice point of view, and I'll talk about that, but I don't know in a pin it down kind of way because embodiment is, it's about connecting to our genuine lived experience. So sometimes it helps to describe it by what it's not. So it's outside of what is outside of our conditioning, which runs very, very fast. So conditioning being what was handed to us unconsciously and in innocence from our families of origin about how we're supposed to be. And then what was handed to us unconsciously and sometimes in innocence in our larger society and culture about what we are and what we're supposed to be. And so those are like these programs (laughs) that we have been given that run very unconsciously. And other things that I would consider to be disembodied is ideology, which these days likes to just mushroom cloud and mushroom cloud in a million different ways. Not that human beings haven't always been engaged with lots of different kinds of ideology, but I think it moves very quickly right now with the tools that we have, (laughs) social media and the internet. Dogma being a kind of ideology or another way of even saying ideology. So these are all things that make us disembodied. And they're things that are pretty common here that we're performing our conditioning in a certain way. And then there's the genuine self. And I never talk about these things in the sense that we're going to like cross the embodiment finish line and like, I'm, I'm a fully embodied person, <laughs> which is why yeah, like, <laughs> I am a hundred percent embodied and integrated. And I have zero amount of unconsciousness or conditioning running in me. Cause I don't think that that's even possible. And I think when we make that the goal I've I've seen people get into really strange territory. I think it's actually the kind of place that things like cults and things spring from is when we have these ideas that we can perfectly achieve full spectrum consciousness or like absolutely decondition deconditioned. Right. Because we we can't really ever completely shake ourselves from things that we've learned in the past. If if we we're we're steeped and immersed in in culture and in expectations. And clearly those early programming, our early programming that that we absorbed is it's pretty hard to unhook from. Like we can certainly consciously change our relationship to it, but I don't know that it ever entirely goes away. It's it's part it is it is part of our life experience. Yeah, I think we want to we want to cultivate a more conscious and tender as opposed to making it the bad value about us, right? A conscious and tender experience of our conditioning that we can bring more of it up to the level of conscious awareness. And to go back to your original question, what does this have to do with embodiment? (laughs) That there is something about the, basically our culture is incredibly mental and very conceptual. And a lot of us (laughs) inhabit just sort of the forehead and the eyes. And as we come to, to inhabit the body more and to know ourselves as our body more, we start to get a lot of the signals that we're below the level of consciousness. And we start to shift, really pretty significantly shift, even if we don't become the perfect deconditioned embodied people. But we start to really shift how we relate to ourselves and to others and to the world. So it has something to do with the body, but it also isn't just the body. You know, when it, when I say inhabit my body, it's like, well, what's me? What's my, if I'm sitting here, like my body's sitting in a chair talking to you right now, <laughs> what am I talking about? And so I'm talking about this partnership of our conscious awareness with the body that we inhabit. 
And, and that really is like, ideally, just to go completely against what we just agreed we were going to do, right? At least to, like, to not go to the ideal extremes, but to be to be living from a place where we're in touch with the wisdom that is within us and that is, and where we're connected with our own experience as it's happening. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting, right? Because it's not like, so I'm not just talking about body sensation because we can get almost superstitious. I've seen about, I need to perfectly pay attention to every signal I'm getting from my body. And actually our bodies run habits too. You know, that's what yeah. things like anxiety is as somebody, you know, I'm somebody who has had to work my way out of anxiety and I still experience that sometimes. It's a right sensation. There with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it exactly. Just, it arrives. It's uh, not something I choose and it's not actually based on reality. So if I wake up with just a wash of anxiety, usually the feeling starts first. And then the thoughts will come. And then sometimes it's the reverse. Thoughts boot up the feeling. And none of them are telling the truth, right? Of like, oh my God, you you should have returned that email yesterday. Like it's not actually <laughs> a major disaster. But our per- our perception is that it is. And and I and I really appreciate that you can that you bring up that the thought can trigger the feeling, but the feeling can also trigger the thought. And, and that those yeah. are, I think that's a lot of times where like people who don't suffer from whether it's hormonal mood swings or the occasional anxiety or depression or whatever, like they don't get that you can't just think your way out of it. <laughs> that, yeah. that it's not just about thinking better thoughts. Yeah. It is really not just like these techniques of noticing the thought and cancel clear or like saying that's not true or whatever, you know, like they happen and the sensations are very, very strong as well. So maybe it's best explained a little more by talking about the three dimensions of experience that are always happening and none of them are the good one or the bad one, right? Mm -hmm. And so we talk about this in the realization process, which is what I teach and I'm sure we'll get to that some, but This is from my teacher who created that, Judith Blackstone, and I find it very helpful. So on the one one level of experience, which is always happening, is the level of matter, like the flesh of my body, the wood of the chair that I'm sitting on, right? The dimension of matter is a real thing. It's really happening. (laughs) And then there's also the dimension, Judith calls it energy. I prefer to call it movement because energy people start to think it's about energy healing or chakra systems or things like that. But it's actually anything that moves and is not matter. So thoughts, emotions, and interoceptive signals, meaning inner sensations in the body, are often what I will put on this dimension of of movement. You know, they come and they go. And my thought of, oh my God, I should have returned that email yesterday. <laughs> I can't hold it in my hand. Yeah. It's the you fluctuations, <laughs> uh, like in, in yoga terminology, right? it, this would be like the the fluctuations of the mind or the fluctuations of of the feelings, that the things that come and yeah. go. And the things that come and go, the yeah. clouds in the sky. Yeah. Right? So we've got yin, the physical stuff. We've got yang, the moving stuff. Yes. So what's the third? The mm-hmm. third is the one we have the least experience and modeling with in what our modern world is right now, speaking as a person in the United States right now. And that's what Judith calls fundamental consciousness, which is a bit of a mouthful. Yes. (laughs) And and it can spin people off into like, that must be complicated or woo-woo or esoteric. And it's actually the opposite of complicated woo-woo or esoteric. It's the ground of being, like the life itself, like the fact that I'm alive and that I'm talking to you right now and my cells are turning over and my osteoclasts and osteoblasts are working and my heart is breathing and all the muscles of respiration are working and my bladder is taking care of itself it has nothing to do with what I think of as me. There's a life force that makes me not inert. And that started when my, you know, when the egg and the sperm came together and a cell divided, right? And kept dividing, kept dividing. So there's something about the ground. So this would be in the metaphor of sky and clouds, the sky, that there is a ground of being of what we can call consciousness that we just don't have a ton of modeling about attuning to in our culture. And so that's what I would call the level of embodiment because it's not the level of the movement 
thoughts, feelings, sensations. And it's not just the level of matter, which would be the more structural model that I started my career in, right? Of like, my ankle hurts, fix my ankle, (laughs) but it's consciousness. And they're all co-arising and they're all valuable. So none of them are bad. (laughs) I also went through Judith Blackstone's realization process meditation teacher training, and I I love her work for precisely that reason that it's so it's so down to earth and and that the the one I think it was the very first training session that I did with her where she just led us through this tiny little practice that was like okay think about your hand and now put your consciousness inside your hand mm-hmm. and experience the world with your conscious, like experience handness, you know, experience what's going on there from the inside out. And I was like, oh my God, that, that right there is the essence of, I think, body awareness and maybe awareness itself. Like as, as I learned more about like, oh, right. Why just the body? Why go, why I can actually extend this into the space that I, that I am arising within. And that, and the fact that, Really, there is no separation between the self and it well, like the chi of the self and the chi of, of everything mm-hmm. else around. That's that's an easier concept, I think, to wrap my mind around. Yeah. And in your background in acupuncture, actually, chi, what a great way. It's just a different word for fundamental consciousness, right? Yeah. It was and and yet I'm not exactly sure about either definition as I play like as I as I consider the definition of chi <laughs> in, yeah. in general. But yeah, there's this idea of of shifting our perception from being at like a, a top-down analytical sense of what's going on in my body to experiencing. And that that's a shift that it shifts the, the the hierarchy of mind over body into something that is a bit more egalitarian. Mm, yeah, great word. I'd love to hear more about how you help people develop a relationship with their bodies, especially if they've been taught to tune them out. You know, like that—that that basically, what matters is is your is your thoughts and your ideas and your beliefs and your ability to express yourself. You know, like that. Basically, the people I'm thinking of all of of my coaching clients who may be really aligned with their careers or with the with being of service to people in their lives, and it's it's really like they don't even think about what their bodies need. Like the it, the, the whole day will go by and they'll have forgotten to drink water or or eat or these what I consider the absolute basics of self-care are not things that that they've been taught to pay attention to. So I'd love to hear just how, if you have kind of a, like, what are the, what are the first few steps that you employ in your practice in helping someone connect to what their bodies might be needing if they're not in the habit of checking in? You know, what comes to mind when you ask me that, because there are several practical ways, you know, like on a web menu that people would see how I help people. You know, I do one-on-one sessions and I teach group work where we're doing these embodied practices, almost exclusively realization process. Not because I think that's the only way. In fact, right now I'm hiring other teachers and other models of embodied practice. But when you talk about how would I, if I'm working with a client who doesn't have much contact with the body, like what would be my approach? What came to mind is that our ideas, our shoulds and shouldn'ts and have to and shouldn't be's, like all those ideas and ideologies and things like that, they usually fit in these very, very, it's hard to describe. So bear with me if this seems strange. It's almost like they're these big, big, big containers that are far away from the me. Right. So to give an example of that, it let's say I have an idea. This is one I use often just because it's, you know, fairly common and relatively uncontroversial as things go these days, but like that it's fairly common. One of the things that's trying to shift for the last several decades is that women were taught that they should be petite and fawning and quiet and subservient. And that's just something that has shown its its face all over the place many times, right? So if that's an idea, I should be happy to serve, quiet, meek, petite, adorable. <laughs> that's an idea. It's a shape. 
And then if I'm talking with a person who holds that idea, and usually they're talking to me because they're grappling with it, we have to get closer to their actual experience of their lives. So how is that playing out, right? Do you have a partner who doesn't want you to have a career life? Do you have a boss who keeps shutting down any of your ideas and tells you that you need to learn how to be nicer? You know, how is it actually playing out? Right. Are you naturally more assertive than tending? Are you, do you naturally have a larger physical form than, uh, than, yes. the, than what's this your model? actual draw? What's your yeah. actual, what's real calling? for you? And then we start to notice that's when we start to notice that as we get closer, 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 that there's something in the body that in those examples would say no, that the body has this grip or recoil or almost like a revulsion to acting against what's true for the person. And then we, we love that, you know, so we're never finding the bad things in us that we need to empty out of the bucket, right? <laughs> Which is another disembodied model. But we find that we're cultivating a relationship with the body and the being. I use them interchangeably, mostly. So that we're, we're saying, oh, yes, like, I hear you. I'm listening. And then, and then we have to take that into action, right? It's not just navel gazing, like, ah, so good to notice. Well, you know, we have to now tenderly, not aggressively perform the new opposite, but tenderly move into, well, what does that mean? Like, do I have to sit in the discomfort of saying to my boss, no, actually, I think I am being plenty nice. I just have a good idea that you're not listening to. That's really uncomfortable if it goes against conditioning. So Absolutely. then we bring it out into our lives, the actual life we're living, not this idea that's kind of farther away from our lived experience. I love that. So you're you're talking about really you're performing something else. You're performing something that doesn't look like this shape that you've been taught to fit into. Instead, you're moving through your your being is showing up differently and and really you're practicing new things. Yeah, and you're doing it with a lot of of love because to go against conditioning feels like a survival threat to the yes. body. We talk about that a lot on this podcast because, I, well, that's 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 the framework that I use when I coach my clients is recognizing that that when we are trying to make changes in our lives, that oftentimes that runs right up against what has gotten us through with a, some degree of success in the past that is no longer working for us, and when we when we have to engage with that. Basically, any any time we're stressed, we're, we we contract. We get into a, a contracted state. We we snap back to this to this well rehearsed shape, and to try to do something different is very scary and difficult. Oftentimes, without without help and support, and 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 yet it's one of the most important things we can do if we are to evolve, if we are truly to to start showing up differently and and living differently. Yeah. Absolutely. And we can't do it with aggressively trying to swing the pendulum to the opposite side or to immediately rip the Band-Aid off and be a totally different person because our nervous system will have a very strong negative opinion. <laughs> exactly. About it's, not that. Gonna be, <laughs> it's not going to be easeful. Mm -hmm. You, yes, you are worth caring for. I hope you know that. And I hope you're acting on it. Are you taking care of yourself in a way that you'd want someone you love to take care of themselves? If not, I can help you up your self-care, self-love, and self-respect game. Picture yourself making time for your joy, honoring your body, letting your heart lead for a while. How good does that feel? I would love to help you align with your heart and your power to operate from a place of grounded, centered, and abundant energy rather than stress and depletion. My coaching superpowers include smart strategy, insight, and deep compassion. I will help you embody self-respect and self-love so your light can shine brighter. I have room on my calendar for just a handful of private coaching clients in 2021. So if your heart is crying out for some support, now is the time to head to brodywelch.com forward slash about and apply. That's brodywelch.com, Brody with an I-E and Welch with a C-H. Now back to the show.
one thing that I have been, that's been something of a rallying cry of mine for the past few years is embodying self-respect. And that idea that if we think, oh yeah, well, I respect myself or I, I'm someone who is worth taking care of. It's like, that can be an idea. And when I'm acting in a way where I'm telling my body to shut up about like what it might need in any given moment, or when I'm, when I'm overriding the cues that my being is giving me in service of an idea of like, I need to be productive or I need to take care of this person's needs before my own or these kinds of things. If that message were coming from somewhere external, we probably wouldn't have any problem telling that person to just take a hike. You know, like that, that it's like, Hey, you don't talk to me that way. You don't tell me that I have to override my need for for sleep by getting this thing done or override my need for movement by staying, change my keyboard. But yet when that voice is coming from my own head, it's much easier to to listen to it and we shouldn't necessarily. And so that idea that embodying self-respect to me is about doing the things moment to moment where we are honoring our beingness where we're tuned into to this inner landscape and this inner wisdom that is worthy of paying attention to. Yeah, and it's a deep it's a deep practice like you're you're sharing, right? It's not so automatic and we're going to do it imperfectly. And it's not about I don't know this is just coming up because I I see this often too. It's not about achieving the perfectly never comfortable state either, which is another way that I see it get interpreted, right? That we're going to only follow what feels like delicious pleasure. I love delicious pleasure, but we're going to follow, I would use the word truth. And mm-hmm. and sometimes truth is one of those words, especially now where it's like, oh God, yeah. <laughs> a phrase that I like that actually comes from Barbara Ehrenreich in her book, Bright Sided, is existential courage. Yeah. And I love that one because existential, like outside of the self, outside of the conditioning, and that there's some courage, right? Like I was mentioning in that example, totally made up example, I've never had a boss in my life, um, (laughs) of the the woman needing to say something to her boss. That takes existential courage. It does. To go against the conditioning and it's not comfortable. Right. What, right. What you're talking about is not hedonism. It's not about, it's not just about giving ourselves pleasure because I think a lot of times people are afraid to listen to their bodies because they think that whatever desires might arise might be scary or might lead them to feeling like, oh, well, this is going to derail me in some way. And, and that's, that isn't necessarily true, right? That there, there is, the basics, I think, of of what we what we know we need to do to take care of ourselves that set us up for being able to do things in the world, <laughs> and that and that there's a that there is a recursive relationship there, but that there is also this existential courage concept that you bring up. To me, that that means being in alignment with a deeper wisdom, right? Yeah. Not not a not a a fleeting desire, and not something that is it's not an optional indulgence it, it's actually it's more aligned with with a wisdom with a capital w or or like kind of that that inner truth with a capital t yeah there's there might be plenty of signals of like oh this uh this keeps talking to me guess i have to pay attention to it and i think that we all have multiple experiences of that if someone wants to to sort out what what their motivation is. Like I, I I hear this from clients frequently, like, oh, well, is it okay to give myself permission to take a nap? Or is that, you know, if I'm doing that every day, does that make me lazy? Or like, is it okay to, to have this second glass of wine or this, you know, like to, to, you know, do, do something that, that feels like an indulgence, so that, but it also feels like what they want. And I think sometimes it is wisdom, you know, like, yeah. uh, and sometimes it isn't. Sometimes it's actually not in our best interest. Do you have a sense of how people can hone their compass to know when something is coming from this place of truth or wisdom or existential courage versus somewhere else? That's a great question. I wish I had like a quick and dirty 
way for that. If, but I think that ultimately the discernment is about over time that we cultivate this intimacy, intimacy with ourselves so we can get a sense, you know, does this body really need rest, work day be damned, which is common. I think we're all, <laughs> you know, we have a lot of workaholism in our societal conditioning, right? Yeah. Or, you know, is that like, you know what, have a third glass of wine, you know, eh, really? Or, or is that just a desire, particularly when there's a drug involved, right? Which does alter our ability to perceive. Right. It is gets behind that, your lens. Right. Exactly. And then it's actually not our truth speaking, but it's a, a drug's truth in the case of um, a glass of wine, but even with other more straightforward things, right. Of like, I don't want to do this. So I'm not going to, is it an avoidance of the existential courage or is it truly, this is a no for me. And I think that those feelings in the self, in the being, in the body are actually fairly subtle at first. And then eventually we start to get a real sense of the signature. Like I have a real sense now after much practice and and many swings and misses <laughs> i have a real sense of what what no just a very true no feels like to me and honestly that has been hard one can you describe it of what it feels like yeah like i'd love for i'd love for you to describe your personal signature of what no feels like you know this gets a little to your original question right of like how can we tell Mm -hmm. I think when it's coming from, when that discernment is the truth, there's something that feels very open about it. It doesn't contract or or shove or pull or yank, you know, <laughs> like my inner like, no, this is just, this is just a no. You know, the way this person is treating mm -hmm. me is out of line. Mm -hmm. This idea or concept someone is bringing to me is just not correct as far as I'm, you know, for my experience, for me personally, it has a, it's very soft. It's very loving. It's very tender. It doesn't hate. It doesn't attack. It doesn't contract. It doesn't feel bad about it. It's just like, uh, no, it states it's very it, simple, open it's, truth. It states its truth. It sounds like it, it doesn't feel like seduction. It doesn't feel like you're being lured in a particular mm, direction. Yeah. And addiction feels like seduction. And we yeah. start to get a sense of that. Right. Uh, my particular addiction is sugar. So I'll feel that mm -hmm. more with the like, what? Who cares if you have another cupcake? So that has seduction qualities to it. And then there are other things that have contract or war, you know, like yep. going against the bad other out there or or towards the self war with the self plenty of that right there is there's so much of that especially when people I, I think probably this will really resonate with a lot of people listening who are trying to do the right things right or, and and yet have some internal struggles that our life can't be necessarily about the struggle that there's some ease that we can tap into when we can hear the wisdom yeah it does have a quality of of ease. And then like you already pointed out, right, there's a way that concepts can co-opt what ease is yeah, <laughs> and be like, I'm ease, you know, come over here. And it's not actually yeah. ease, but you start to get that sense of the difference between fake ease and that real, just like open-handed, nope, this is just the truth, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. And sometimes that truth leads you somewhere uncomfortable and then you have to take action and that's scary. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, any of us have had those rock bottom moments, right? Where it's like, uh -huh. I have to leave this relationship. I have to leave this job. I have to, I'm a sober person. I have to stop drinking. Those are not easy moments, yeah. but they're the truth. Right, right, where you have to do this, this right next hard thing. I'm curious, just at the risk of getting this conversation more disembodied, I, I want to I wanna bring this home for people about, about, especially people who who are kind of like maybe have really honed their intellect or maybe honed their meditation practice in a way that isn't particularly that doesn't include the body about why should we bother trying to have a dialogue with the dimension of with these other dimensions of our being cuz life's better without sleepwalking 
<laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I have slept walked into a million brick walls and I will sleepwalk into more in my life. Again, I'm not, you know, the perfectly embodied person, but my life was mostly sleepwalking and not in an unusual way where I would have a memoir worthy tale of, you know, wow, I have, you know, really ordinary life when I was disembodied, very standard stuff. But I was really sleepwalking in a way that I was causing harm to myself and harm to people in my life in small ways, the harm in my community by not being able to show up for things, not intentional harm, but just sleepwalking harm. And life is better. You know, the relationships that you have with everyone, including like your grocery store clerk, <laughs> get better and more genuine. And you're able to have an actually well-tuned internal compass that's going to lead you to what's true. You know, what's true for you, what's your true experience, who are the people you truly connect with or the things you truly connect with. And that this isn't an abdication of things like intellectual pursuits, which I personally love. Learning is one of the great loves of my life. And it can be embodied. Learning, you know, intellect can be embodied. I feel like anything can be embodied because what we're talking about is like true nature as opposed to a thing, like a hobby of feeling the body. <laughs> yes. It's about connecting to the self. I, I love that answer. It's it's really it's beautiful. And where I go with it is that when it's like we, we can break our own habits, we can we can break up with our like it, that getting getting down below the layer of that ideology that you started that you opened the conversation with allows us the freedom to be who we are in a deeper way. And it makes it like, it just becomes less personal. Yeah, exactly. I, I feel like that sort of, that state that we get into sometimes where we're incensed, I call it the, how dare you? How dare you? You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's usually our conditioning responding to being called into question, right? And these things yeah. that are much more open, that's just an embodied capacity to be with whatever reality is serving up in any given moment. Well, that sounds nice. Uh, I'm sure if people are out there saying like, yeah, I want to get in on this. Could you could you walk us through a, a practice? Sure. You know, I was going to use the Judith one that you mentioned about oh, the that hands. very one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just because it's such a nice like it's such a nice example of internal versus external space. But I think yeah. instead what I'll do is an orienting practice. So this doesn't come from realization process, but I use it constantly because it brings us into like I was talking about before, instead of this far away big shape, all these ideas of what we should be doing or what's coming later in the week, it brings us into the only place that embodiment and life actually happens, which is this moment right here. So these are shorthand things that people can use at any, at any time. So we'll go through two senses here uh, using vision and just any of you listening wherever you are right now just taking a moment to look around the environment that you're in and to drop in the phrase this is what i'm able to see right now and that you don't have to look in order to see it happens it arrives very naturally there's nothing effortful about it and you can also drop in the phrase this is what this moment looks like and we'll just do one more brief one with hearing because I find that people often have different senses work better we're just going to play with these two for today so this is what I'm able to hear right now and this is what this moment sounds like And just seeing if letting you your awareness come through your senses in that receptive, effortless way, for those of you who are playing with it while you're listening, does it shift in any way your experience of this moment, of how you feel in your nervous system, how you feel in your body, and also of how this moment shows up to you? Like I usually find that that brings up a lot of 
tenderness. I become really affectionate towards silly things. Like right now I have the sound of the heat running in my house. (laughs) It's not a concept of like how lucky I am to have heat in my house. There's just something sweet about slowing down enough to attune to the moment. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really, there's so much more in the moment when we slow down and pay attention to it on subtler levels. And I appreciate what you were saying about not having to, it, that our, our, our society is so young biased, right? That we, it's easy to think I'm doing a practice. Now I'm going to effortfully <laughs> right. be perceiving the things around me instead of just yeah. really being, right? Like yeah. just relaxing into what is and observing what is. I remember actually even in my early training as a body worker, the idea of listening with your hands as opposed to mm. looking for something with your hands, like that that's going to feel really different if you if you're palpating, if you if you take your hands in a flat way and you put it on your arm and you just gently press down and listen with this attitude through your hand as opposed to searching for something and probing and poking and and, and that that really there is um just that, I, that shifting it, to me, that shifts my beingness from yang mode to yin mode to yeah. just, to just lean back and listen instead of looking. Yeah. The difference between the, like, I am doing something I am exerting, you know, mm-hmm. we can do these things in a disembodied way. Like disembodied seeing would be, I see a tree, I see a shelf, I see a light, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. and we're like tagging it, but it, we don't have a feeling That doesn't change the way we actually feel in our body. And I don't mean emotionally necessarily. Um, So yeah, that shift to receptivity. I love that about touch, listening with the hands. You work with people in an online practice community. And is this, I'd like to hear more about it. Is is it basically, well, I'll, I'll let you do the talking, but it sounds like it sounds like a great resource for people who are interested in in practicing this very thing. Yeah, you know, I um, like you mentioned, I've had a, you know a couple of podcasts. The one that I do now, Liberated Being, took a big hiatus and made a big shift when it was originally Liberated Body. And one of the things that I've discovered over and over and over is that talking about things and thinking about things again, it's a great joy of my life but it doesn't actually change things. <laughs> right? <laughs> Isn't that sad, people listening, that you can't yeah. <laughs> just listen to this podcast and absorb it all? It's just like, as I was just joking with another guest, that like talking about herbs is different than taking them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Doing things changes things. Practice yeah. changes things. Taking the herbs, putting them in your body changes things. Doing the thing. Learning everything about Chinese herbs actually will give you a lot of information, which you can maybe use to help yourself and others, but It's not going to change anything until you take herbs. Right. Yeah. So I I set up uh, Liberated Being. It's been running for almost a year now. We started right before the lockdown, strangely. Very strange timing. Excellent timing. Yeah, it was excellent timing. It was definitely divine intervention there. And so we're a community of people all over the globe. And what it has been thus far is me teaching realization process. So six days a week, we practice together. And then we have a private, meaning not Facebook, (laughs) social media group where we can talk about like, why is it when I sit in my heart, I feel nothing or rage or like I want to die? You know, these are things that actually come up when we practice. So a way where we can be supported as we become more embodied or like, oh my gosh, playing with that, I just suddenly the way that I'm interacting with my toddler is like remarkably different. Like the love I feel for him is so different. So it's a place where we can practice and then talk about what comes up in practice. And um, I'm expanding right now because I, one of the reasons why I run other, you know, podcasts where I'm always talking to people is that I'm not dogmatic. I don't believe that there's one true way, (laughs) one right method, and that we're all hooked up a little differently. So some people cultivate embodiment through movement, like Feldenkrais would be a great example and one of many examples. Some people it's through, like my way has been through um, the realization process. So I'm hiring other teachers so that we can become an embodied practice studio with a variety of different methods and and teachers. So it's not about 
the Brooke show, which has also never really been my calling. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I have a huge respect for that. I, just that that's part of the reason this podcast exists is so that people can hear so many different approaches towards exploring how to be well in a busy world and, and the strategies that might work. And if people, I, I'll definitely have a link to your community in the show notes. Is there any last words of wisdom you'd like to offer with for people about the importance of embodiment or encouragement along their embodiment journey? I would say to actually follow if and when it's compelling for you. You know, another way that we we make things into objects is like, okay, the good thing is to be embodied. I'm going to do it. I'm going to make myself. And you know what? Maybe it's not ripe. Like so there is such a thing as as useful and conscious disembodiment. And so I prefer a much more gentle off-gassing approach, you know, so maybe this, this conversation, if you've never done anything like this is the beginning of like, Hmm, like a little affectionate curiosity. And then you can follow it from there, wherever it takes you, you know, does it take you back to your yoga practice? Does it take you into a somatic meditation lineage, whatever it is that you get to listen to what calls to you? Beautiful. And I think also just a caveat to that would be that that sometimes it's not safe to be in a body and that 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 dissociating from the body is one of the ways that consciousness protects itself and that our minds yeah. our minds and emotions survive horrible things. And so as we get this as we develop this gentle curiosity about what it's like to be embodied, that this can open you up to old memories, old emotions. I, I literally just had this happen just a few days ago with a client on the table um, where she had all these suppressed memories come back to her. And then it's, it's like, it's a can of worms that that ultimately is really healing to unpack, but that might well enlist the support of a therapist or an acupuncturist or a body worker who can allow you to be in your body in a safe way while perhaps if there is old trauma to recover from doing doing that work in a way that that feels supported yeah i'm really glad you brought that through and you know i do group work in my group and i do one on one work but i i don't think group work is always the right container you know so sometimes especially as we become more embodied sometimes we do encounter these things and it can be really helpful to have the intimacy that a one-on-one -on -one therapeutic relationship can can bring you and particularly with people who are not just trauma informed but really trained as trauma therapists absolutely Brooke, I feel like I could talk to you all day and yet I know you have a life, so <laughs> we'll let you get back to it. Brooke Thomas, you have been a, such a fabulous guest today and I really appreciate your time and your wisdom. Thank you so much for having me on. I feel like I could talk to you forever too. Obviously, kindred spirits, thank you for putting together your show. So thank you for being such an amazing podcast listener. I am including a free meditation if you're wanting to experience this fundamental consciousness form of meditation that Brooke and I were talking about today. You can download it in a link in the show notes over at brodywelch.com or wherever you get your podcasts. It'll opt you into my newsletter, but of course you can unsubscribe at any time. And on a personal note, today is my birthday and I love giving gifts on my birthday. So enjoy that meditation. And if you would like to give me a gift in return, a wonderful thing that I would super appreciate is for you to tell somebody about this show and why they might want to give a listen and or leave a rating or a review wherever you get your podcasts, because that helps other people discover a healthy curiosity and therefore makes this time really that much more well spent. Thanks so much and happy holidays. Thanks for listening today. To check out the show notes, get on my email list or drop me a line, head to brodywelch.com. That's Brody with an IE and Welch with a CH. I'd love to hear from you. If you learned something new or feel inspired to try something different in your life, I'd love for you to pay it forward by sharing this episode with a friend who you think could also benefit and give them a reason to listen. You'll be helping to create a world where we encourage each other to embody self-respect. 
Until next time, be good to yourself. <laughs>